Well, good day to everyone. I'm Joe Casciani, your host for the Living 200 Club podcast. Our conversations are all about aging well and doing what it takes mentally and physically to live longer and healthier. Our guests share insights and recommendations about successful aging, stories of perseverance and inspiration about our future. On today's program, we look at the positive ways to view aging. Our guest is Dr. Lisa Rill, a professional with a long history in geriatric services and research, and currently executive director at Senior Life Source a nonprofit organization that provides education on aging for all ages. We discuss a number of topics, including the difference between chronological, functional, and subjective ages. When does aging begin? How do we define someone as old? And when do we consider ourselves as old? We welcome this conversation about the various perspectives on positive aging. First, a little background. Lisa Rill received her PhD in sociology, specializing in aging and health. She served as a geriatric social worker and worked as research faculty for the Claude Pepper Center on Aging at Florida State University, addressing quality of life and long-term care. Dr. Rill is an editorial board member for the Certified Senior Advisors Journal and a Certified Eden at Home Associate Mentor. She is currently the executive director at Senior Life Source, a nonprofit organization that provides education on aging for all ages. Lisa, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Looking forward to this conversation. I always okay. like to open by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about the journey that brought you to where you are today. It's been a long riding road for you, but give us the highlights. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it started around 22 years ago. I worked as a social worker in the nursing homes, and I did that for about five years after undergraduate. Um, I really enjoyed working with the residents and getting to know them and just spend time hearing their stories of life, and it was really great. Um, Unfortunately, it was also difficult sometimes with some of the bureaucracy sure. um, working in the um, industry to really provide the care that I wanted to. So I eventually left that to go to graduate school to with the high hopes of learning more about the industry and how maybe we could help improve the care and quality of life for our elders. Mm -hmm. So I, I went for sociology and my PhD in aging and health. Uh, gerontology wasn't as formulated as a discipline at that time. So I, I took the opportunity as a sociologist to really engage in aging um, mm -hmm. for my background. And then after I graduated, I got that position as research faculty at the Claude Pepper Center on Aging where a lot of my research focused on, again, quality of life in long-term care, hoping to improve processes and procedures. Mm. I did that for about eight years, and then I really wanted to get back to the people and help educate others and everything that I've learned. So um, when I moved out here to California, I joined Senior Life Source as mm -hmm. the executive director and hoping to educate everyday people and everyday things about aging um, for all ages, really. Sure, sure. Hoping to prepare people that can be confident advocates for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's important, sure. And that's a lot of varied experience in different settings that you had some exposure to the older adult world industry. So um, clinical social worker and nursing homes, researcher, how did all these roles really inform your ideas on positive aging? Yeah, so, you know, my career path is somewhat unique. So having that insider knowledge of the aging industry from the perspective of a social worker working with older adults in the nursing home, and then a more macro comprehensive level of understanding of the system from my time as a researcher 
So it really allowed me to experience and examine many different faces of aging. <laughs> so with a world focused on these negative ageist views of what it's like to grow old and it being just so ingrained in our everyday lives that I was really drawn to finding the positive um, things for aging. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I had to uncover ways that you know, challenge these commonly held ideas that aging is something to fear, or even worse, you know, that it's a disease that needed to be cured. Yeah, we still see that, don't we? Um, mm -hmm. We'll get into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could see well, the challenges, of course, especially in the nursing home setting. And then at the research level, you could see still the views and some of the real challenges that come with aging. And, and we know that that negative stereotype is such a, I mean, it's not valid, but there is a very small percentage of older adults that do have this physical decline and do become, I mean, maybe 5% or less, but they do become dependent on networks and healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, let's, let's talk about the different types of ages. And I mentioned that in the intro, chronological, functional, subjective, biological. Tell us what these are and what they, what they really connote. Sure. This is one of my favorite topics. Yeah. You know, um, although it sounds simple, you know, when do you become old? There are multiple ways of defining old age. So just a quick side story, um, when I took my first introduction to aging in the life course class, my professor asked the same question. Um, and so many like others and myself, we automatically thought 65, right? Mm -hmm. And she asked us why. We really couldn't come up with a good answer other than, well, it's retirement age. <laughs> you know? And she replied by saying like, well, but retirement age is different in other countries. Um, so the point is that the thing that I really love most about sociology is that it forces us to think about everyday things that we just take for granted or we think of as just common sense. And then we question, why is it so? And I feel that that's how we progress as a society. Really. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to your question, um, when is someone old? Um, gerontologists who are people who study the aging process use various measures to describe and, and categorize the aging process. So let's start with chronological age. This is the simplest way to categorize age. Um, it's measured in terms of years and months and days since birth. But it's somewhat arbitrary, you know, according to social or cultural norms. And it's used to determine eligibility for certain milestones in life. So think about your voting age, driving age, drinking age, retirement, right? So why, for example, is retirement age 65 in the US? Well, it started as, a, as this arbitrary decision uh, based on the retirement age used in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. So which um, actually in 1881, it became the first nation to adopt an old age social insurance program. And then in 1935, when the US chose to implement a retirement program, some of the existing pension programs used age 65 as a retirement age and others used 70. And so they did this study and they found that um, 65 produced more usable and manageable system that could be self-sustaining with moderate payroll mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. So then they just adopted the retirement age of 65. So since then, chronological age, um, this marker has been used to identify older adults. Okay. Now, so social gerontologists like myself use chronological age as a marker in our research. So um, the choice usually depends on the topic being studied. So we, we like to um, distinguish between older age groups, right? It's not just 65 plus, because there's so many years, so much diversity, right? So we like to break it down to young old, which is 65 to 74, um, middle old, 75 to 84, and the oldest old, 
which um, at one point was age 85 and older, but now, as you know, these categories are starting to change as more people are living past 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so otherwise, this categorization of, of um, chronological aging is not a very useful measure for defining old age. Okay. So, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. <laughs> so that's chronological age. Chronological. Now, okay. um, when determining old age, right, there's more to it than just this number. And that's where functional age comes into play. So functional age takes into consideration different factors such as an individual's ability and their appearance. So, you know, people become old when they no longer can perform major roles of adulthood. And as we know, people's bodies age at different rates, right? So a common measure of functional age includes someone's um, ability to do activities of daily living. And what we mean by that is, you know, your personal care, such as bathing and eating and dressing. Mm -hmm. So an example would be, you know, if there's someone who's 65 years old, chronological age, mm -hmm. they could have a functional age that is much older, maybe like 85, because they use a wheelchair to get around. While Another 65 year old could have a functional age that is younger, maybe around 45, because they're they're still able to run a marathon. Mm -hmm. So, but just like chrono chronological age, functional age also has its drawbacks. So the main problem is that it's inherently ageist because it focuses mm -hmm. on characteristics that decline with age, mm -hmm. such as eyesight or hearing, right? but it ignores the attributes that improve with age, such as wisdom and happiness. <laughs> mm, okay. So is there a scale or is there, a, regarding functional age, is there a way that we can determine our own functional age or is it just more arbitrary? Yeah, I would say it's also arbitrary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to more of what we would feel as a subjective age. Um, which is probably how most people um, define their age without even knowing. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so sure. subjective age is, you know, how young or old a person feels and then their perceptions of when other people become old. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're familiar, you know, with that saying, you're only as old as you feel. So um, and the key factors that influence one's subjective age is identity of their sorry their object, subjective age identity is their health their activity level um, their cognitive abilities and also gender and social class influence someone's subjective age mm -hmm. so um, an example is that one person may be 75 chronological years and feel much younger because they're healthy and active well, another person who maybe is 55 could feel a lot older because they have mobility constraints. Mm -hmm. So um, now the perception of when other people become old, that also shifts by age group. So um, people ages 18 to 29, they tend to think that old age starts around 60, while people who are older, around 65 plus, tend to think of others as old, starting around 74 or 75. So it's really interesting. And um, one of the theories behind this, and you may be familiar with this, with this um, feelings associated with subjective age, is this thing called age group dissociation effect. Um, and what this is, is that individuals tend to psychologically disassociate themselves from stigmatized groups. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there is a significant amount of stigma attached to old age, right? So in other words, as people grow older, they view themselves as becoming a part of this group that they have these negative views towards their entire life. Um, so it creates this need to distance themselves from the group. And they can do that by reporting they feel younger than their actual biological age. Sure. Yeah, I, I remember um, just a brief incident. My 
father-in-law had his sister in a in a nursing home and he was probably in his 80s and we took him to visit his sister and um, had the visit and all that and as he was walking out he said look at all those old people in there and that's mm -hmm. the same thing right we're disconnecting from that from that group yeah now I, I i love the concept of subjective age i've i've read some research you're familiar with it a lot of studies showing that people who think of themselves as younger than their chronological age actually cope better with stresses and tend to take more preventive healthcare steps and actually um ohio longitudinal study i think found that people with that younger subjective age also live longer than people who see themselves as older in their chronological age. So again, it's that that whole notion of mindset and where we think we are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, wow. fascinating. And then we have the, the whole concept of biological age and biomarkers and what scientists mm -hmm. can use to detect how fast a body is aging independent mm -hmm. of chronological age and the biomarkers. Mm -hmm. um, that can really determine those telomere endings and a lot of those other, you may know more about it, but mm -hmm. these, these ways to really identify the actual age of the body. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes, a little bit. Um, you know, there's not a hundred percent agreement on, on this one. Mm -hmm. So some people use functional age and biological age interchangeably. Um, but others suggest that that they are different so they um, say that biological age are tests that require like you're talking about blood uh, dna samples and analysis mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that where it's functional age complements biological age by validating that a person can actually function at that indicated age mm -hmm. so. okay. okay yeah yeah and i know we're seeing a lot of research on this and i'm not that close to it but there are ways to detect is our body aging faster than it should for our chronological age. So that's another another way to, we don't want to say, well, my biological age is uh, 55, but we don't, we don't really know unless we go through the tests, of course. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's helpful though, to have these different, um, different scales, different ways to view the age, chronological age, how many years we've been alive functional age how well we're mandolin uh, managing our role um and then the subjective age what do we view in ourselves yeah, yeah that's good that's yeah. good yeah how about social roles how do they come into play yeah that's great um so social roles are you know expectations or guidelines for people who occupy a given life position right so um, and over the course of our life, we move through these different social roles to go from a child, their student, spouse, parent, grandparent, right? These are all different social roles. Um, and every social role has a different meaning. So, for example, if I ask you to imagine a retiree, you might think of an older man playing golf. Or if I ask you to picture a widow, you might imagine an older woman with white hair, maybe a sad appearance. But social roles don't always conform to these images. So consider, um, for example, someone maybe that joins the mil military, um, they can retire after 20 years. So if they, they entered the military at 18, they can retire at 38. Mm -hmm. So it's not the typical image of a retiree. And likewise, not all widows or widowers are, are older. You know, some of the widows from the unfortunate tragic event of 9-11 were in their 30s. Mm -hmm. They lost their spouses. So again, social roles aren't always a useful way to define a person's age. Mm -hmm. They're almost a negative, um, a negative take. I mean, it sounds like we have these expectations of what you should be doing at Mm -hmm. 60 or 90 and they they sound like they're more limiting at least until we let go of those old views but they tend to be limiting rather than expanding yeah. so we think of a 90 year old as being helpless or dependent 
-hmm. and that ain't so we know that's not so for many many 90 year olds so okay. um, the whole concept of social roles well that brings us into this whole view about ageism and you know we still see a lot of these negative stereotypes about older adults and what you should be doing in your 60s or 70s or 90s so why do you think we still have these negative stereotypes out there what's 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 going on what's keeping them around sure um this could be like a whole nother podcast so yeah. you know, yeah. we could focus on but you know the short of it is, is it's so just ingrained deeply in our culture our society that we don't even realize that we're doing it um so something as simple as someone saying oh wow you just turned 65 well you look great for your age uh -huh. um you know why do you say for your age why all of a sudden does that matter um and of course it makes you feel good and that is how deeply ingrained it is because you want to feel good at feeling looking younger um so it's these even these simple everyday activities that you don't even think is influencing these these ageist ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really hard, unless you think about it, to separate it um, from your everyday life in society. You have to really think about these things, and nobody likes to do that. Really. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and you know, everyone's guilty of it. I was guilty of it until I kind of realized, wow, yeah. <laughs> That's sure. pretty ageist. <laughs> yeah, even even the, the notion of retiring at 65, and it means mm -hmm. Well, we probably shouldn't be thinking about working anymore. No, that's that's invalid. I mean, that's not fair, mm -hmm. right? We can work as long as we want, and uh, sixty-five is is that marker. But it's it's got a pejorative. It's got a real negative connotation to retire at sixty-five. So mm -hmm. if we change it to retiring at seventy or seventy-five, that would probably open up, kind of give our you know our society more positive views about how capable we can be in our mm -hmm. 60s and 70s and later yeah. yeah yeah so we still see that we still see it in in commercials we see it in uh tv programs and movies um i don't know if it's as prevalent in other countries mm -hmm. as it is here in the u.s but yeah. i wouldn't be surprised if it was it definitely is the world health organization is definitely working towards um dispelling ageist views on a global level. They're very active in that. Um, and it's just, it's the last, I like to say, ism or ist, mm. ageism or ageist views that's, that's really accepted in our society. We've got a lot of attention going on around racism, sexism, you know, things like that. But mm -hmm. um, again, it's just so ingrained that we don't even think of it um, as damaging as these other. Mm -hmm sure so what what are your recommendations what what is um well it gets into social advocacy and kind of raising our awareness raising our consciousness about the capabilities of uh seniors and mm -hmm. living on to our 70s 80s 90s so what are what are some of the steps that we can take to shift this view i mean we see it what can we do Sure. Well, I like to focus on one part of senior advocacy, and um, that is understanding that all individuals are entitled to this self-determination as mm. they age and where they live. So this includes being empowered with choice, dignity, respect, uh, um, and living with purpose throughout all your stages of life. So we, we should have control and the knowledge to decide how we'd like to live through our extended years, right? So we can all kind of agree on that. But when it comes down to actually doing that, that's when things kind of get a little, a little messed up. So mm -hmm. self-determination can be violated if an action is taken maybe by a family member in their quote unquote best interest, right? Of the older adult, maybe an older parent um, without taking their desires into consideration. And this is really common occurrence when maybe an older adult wants to age in place in their home, but the family doesn't feel it's safe. So it's really important to work together to find the best solution. 
Uh, the family members need to listen to the older adult and find out options that are compatible as possible. So, you know, in the end, if the older adult is competent, the final decision should be their choice. And, you know, this can be an unpopular opinion, but, you know, life is about making risky, uncertain choices. And just as some of you send your children off to make their own choices at 18, um, knowing they might not always choose the best, safest path, you know, this should also apply to older adults and not end once a person reaches a certain age. Um, so, you know, without choice, you can quickly lose your sense of purpose and your quality of life. Um, I have an example of one of my friends is calling them, you know, my father keeps climbing the ladder. How do I get him to stop? It's not safe. He's at risk for falls. You know, he, I think he was a painter. And I'm like, listen, you know, all you can do is voice your concerns, help create a safe space you know, talk to him about it, um, maybe a way that you both can feel comfortable. Um, and in the end, you know, it's, it should be his choice. Mm -hmm. She didn't really like that at first, but she understood. <laughs> yeah. No, um, that's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so I'm just saying it. So you aging, it's aging with dignity and feeling empowered to make one's decisions, you know, being treated as a competent human being, making decisions together about your care. Um, and this can really be achieved once we understand all the different aspects of the aging process. So the positive and the negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so respecting the person's right to make his or her own decisions, mm -hmm. allowing them the freedom to make those decisions. And as you say, we can express our opinion. Here's my argument. Here's why I don't think you should be driving anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other person says, well, it was just a mistake. I couldn't find the car. So yeah, you look for some, compromises. And um, frankly, I, you know, I, I had someone on my program just a couple of weeks ago, and she, she was talking about how families often make the decisions for their parent mm -hmm. or sibling. And um, when the when the older adult goes along with it, um, she, my guest said, well, that's another example of ageism. We're, we're letting other people make our decisions for us, even though you know, we, there might be reasons for that, but um, it's up to us too, as an older adult, to dig our heels in and, and not be so willing to yield. I mean, we mm -hmm. want to listen to reason, of course, and other arguments, but yeah. um, we should view ourselves as still being capable and still having mm -hmm. a degree of, of functional performance and a lot of that. So it's our own That's shift too, right? It's our own attitude yeah. about aging and staying independent, as independent as possible. Yeah. Exactly. And that goes back to your self perceptions of these ageist views of even yourself and how ingrained it is. And, you know, nowadays there are so many wonderful resources out there that can help you through all these different situations, even starting a conversation, how to do that. You know, it's difficult um, and people are at different stages in life. So just knowing that there's ways to work through it and people that you can connect with um, that can help you in those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, aging in place is one of the big ones, right? Because <laughs> most of us want to live in our own homes and we don't want to go to a, an assisted living facility. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we have to look at what are the risks and what are the options, what are the opportunities? And you're right, mm -hmm. this conversation is indispensable. We really need to have it because when we put it off, then we're making crisis mode decisions, and they're usually not the right ones because we're acting, you know, just on impulse off the cuff. And we need to think through what the options are and take the plans and uh, preparation to to say, okay, down the road, if and when such and such happens, here's what we're gonna kind of consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot about educating and uh, staying informed ourselves and making informed decisions and letting our family members know, look, um, I respect your your opinion. I respect your desire to keep me off the ladder or keep me out, out of the car. But um, um, here's where I am. And these these conversations are indispensable, as I said. Yeah, well, 
But tell us about Senior Life Source. What what do you do? What's the mission of this organization? What are some of the successes? Yeah, so um, you mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Senior Life Source is a nonprofit organization. We serve the greater San Diego area um, by providing education on aging for all ages. Again, we don't want you to wait for that <laughs> crisis situation. So we provide interactive panels, virtual and in-person, um, with local experts. So our mission is to help them become confident advocates for themselves and their loved ones. And we do this by preparing them with knowledge and trusted resources that they need to make their informed decisions on any aging issue. And the end goal is to enhance their quality of life through education by connecting people to their community resources. So um, why is this important? Well, you know, we're in an aging society. By 2030, we're gonna, the US will witness a demographic shift that we've never seen before, where older adults 65 plus will outnumber children. So a critical issue that we're all kind of facing as this newly aging society is just figuring out how to suitably care for ourselves and our, and our loved ones as we age through these extended life stages. Um, so one of our successes, I would just like to say, you know, you were a part of it. <laughs> uh, recently, we did um, an event with AARP California, uh, a panel of experts, and we talked about helping socially isolated um, seniors who are concerned about COVID and safely re-engaging in the community. So we help provide tips and stories and resources of um, others who had successfully re-engaged in their community. So really it's just, it could be on any topic, um, on aging and really just connecting people to their, their resources so they can get assistance in whatever they need. Yeah, it's a great program, great resource, very important to provide this education and to, as you say, kind of collaborate with other aging organizations and mm -hmm. kind of spread the spread the message about successful aging and how to manage the um, changes that come along. Yeah, that was a great that was a great panel. I was very <laughs> um, I was very happy to be a part of it. It was a great discussion talking about social isolation and mm -hmm. steps we can take. So um, yeah, it was a good it was a good model, and I, I really think that's smart because the more collaboration we can do with other organizations the better yeah 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 great so uh we're just about out of time what would you hope sure. our audience takes away from our conversation today lisa all right so let's uh return to the original question right when is someone old um by now i hope you'd be able to answer this question with the key takeaway being well it's not just one simple answer. Um, so the point is not that it's impossible to define old age, but rather knowing that regardless of what definition a person chooses to use, there's going to be variability um, between one person to the next. And even though there's 53 million individuals age 65 plus um, in the US, you know, they are a heterogeneous group. There are general patterns that can be observed um, in adult development and in just the aging population. So um, the definition that social gerontologists like me use really depends on what we want to know in our research um, to examine these trends. For instance, we might look at um, older voters and their trends of voting. So um, with that, you know, now that you understand all these terms, mm -hmm. would you consider yourself as old? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. That was good. And that's important to remember. It's how do we view ourselves and how do we view our continued functioning? And uh, there's always opportunity for moving forward at any level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're out of time today, Lisa, but before I wrap up, I just want to remind my listeners about visiting the website livingtoanunder.club, sign up for our email list and download a free copy of my nine tips to make living longer enjoyable. While you're there on the website, be sure to peruse our library of blogs and podcasts 
And also you'll find my email address and an option to set up a brief call. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode and, and others. So let me know what you're thinking. And finally, if you're interested, reach out to me to schedule a presentation for your group in person or online. I think there's real value in helping older adults feel inspired about their future. So Lisa, thanks so much for being a guest on our show today. For those Thank who might so want to contact much. you, how can they do that? Sure. Um, my email is simple, lisa at seniorlifesource.org, or you can visit my website at www.seniorlifesource.org. Lisa at seniorlifesource.org and the website is seniorlifesource.org. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks again. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned more. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Hope to see you next time.